Tonight we're going to talk about the Bible. So the last few weeks we've talked about how God is eternal and how uh, after we die we'll live for eternity as well. And then uh, we've talked about um, what it looks like for us to have our relationship with God. And then we're going to talk about tonight what God's Word is like. And so uh, I want to tell a little bit of story about when I was first introduced to the Bible. And then we'll talk through what some of it says and why we, why we trust this book. Why we trust what God has revealed to us. In the Bible. Uh, I didn't grow up like many of you in the fact that I didn't grow up going to a church. I didn't have a family that attended a church regularly, and so I didn't do a program like Awana. I didn't go to a church on Sunday morning. I didn't grow up knowing anything about the Bible. My parents didn't read the Bible to me, and so I wasn't familiar with even the stories of the Bible. I was probably 17 or 18 years old before I first even started to think about uh, who God was and what God might mean in my life. And so uh, through a story that took place in that, I, I was uh, at a funeral, and I was really sad. A family member of mine had passed away, and a cousin um, and I was uh, distraught over that. I was crying out of sadness and, and frustration at what had happened. And I was listening to a pastor at the funeral. And uh, for a moment, he picked up a Bible like this one and he began to read from it. And while he was reading from his Bible, I stopped crying. And then when he stopped reading from his Bible, I started crying again. And, and I just remembered when the service was done that the only time of the service I wasn't crying was while this, while this pastor was reading from his Bible. And so I uh, left the funeral and I thought, I don't know what all that book is about, but I think I want to learn and read that book and see what other things it may do in my life besides just calm me for a moment. And so I was 17 years old. I went to a bookstore and bought a Bible by myself. There wasn't even an old one in the house somewhere and just began to read it. And so I started, uh, like you would read most books, I started reading at the beginning in the book of Genesis and enjoyed that because it's a lot of stories. And then I read Exodus and enjoyed parts of that because it's a lot of stories, but then it turns into just how to build a big tent. And then I started reading Leviticus, which is just a bunch of rules and laws and teachings. And I started to get really confused. Uh, the reason I started to get really confused was, even though I hadn't read the Bible before, I knew somehow Jesus was kind of the main character in it. And I was confused because I had read the Bible for almost a month now, and I hadn't found Jesus yet. And so I went to some friends at school, and I just said, can you show me where Jesus is in the Bible? That was the first question I asked about the Bible. Can you show me where Jesus is in the Bible? And, and those kids, uh, friends in school, started to tell me uh, different things I didn't know about the Bible yet. And they started to bring me to their church youth group uh, when I was 17. And so I spent a couple of years then uh, going to church on my own uh, and starting to learn about God from his word. And so in, in my story of understanding who God was, it really did start with what the Bible says. That's where I learned a lot about who God was, was just from my own reading of the Bible. And as many of you know, we spend a lot of time in Awana talking about the Bible and trying to memorize uh, parts of the Bible because of the value that it has for us. And so I want us to spend some time tonight talking about why we believe in the Bible, why we trust it, why it's worth us spending all of this time talking about memorizing, listening to. And I want to start with just one of the quotes from the Bible. This is uh, Psalm 119, verse 160. That's a lot of verses in that Psalm. But Psalm 119, verse 160 just says this about God. All your words are true, and all your righteous laws are eternal. Does God, everything you have said, everything you have written and given to us in the Bible, all of it's true, and all of your righteous laws are eternal. Everything you've said should be true of us. It, it all happened. Everything this book records, the stories it tells about people like Adam and Eve, or about people like Moses parting the water, Jesus raising from the dead. These are all stories that happened. They're not, they're not just made up stories, they're happened. And, and one of the reasons we can trust that it's true is because almost all of the stories as they're told are told by people who witnessed them. They weren't told hundreds of years later by by authors who maybe got the stories passed down to them or exaggerated by the time they got to them. They're talked about by people as they happened. Uh, I'll give you an example. How many of you have ever heard of the historical figure Alexander the Great? Have you ever heard that name? Guy in history named Alexander the Great, he was uh, a ruler in about the three to 400 BC time frame. 
conquered lots of countries. Uh, at least that, uh, what we know about him is that he conquered lots of countries. And, and yet what is interesting about Alexander the Great is everything we know about Alexander the Great was written over 300 years after he died. And by only one person, 300 years after the story happened. It'd be like if everything you knew about Abraham Lincoln, I was writing right now. And I was the only person who had ever written anything down about Abraham Lincoln. That's, that's what our knowledge of Alexander the Great is like. Stuff that was written hundreds of years after he died and only by one person. And what's different from that is when it comes to something like the Bible, something like Jesus's life and story, in just the Bible alone, we have four different people who have written about it. Most of them who wrote about it while it happened or just shortly after it happened. In fact, in, in all of the world, the Bible is the most well-recorded ancient document there is. There's the most sources of it written by the most people, copied the most places, talked about in the most ways. It's the most well-recorded book in all of history. And we trust it because it's well-recorded. We trust it because it's written by eyewitnesses. We trust it was because it was written shortly after the events happened. But those aren't all the reasons. The Bible, we, we see when God says that it's true and we want to believe him, it's, we see not just that it was written and it records history well, we see God revealed prophecy in it. God talked about things that hadn't yet happened and we got to watch them happen later. Prophecy, he, he named people like King Cyrus who would defeat the Babylonians and invite the people of God back into the promised land. And then that happened. A king of Persia named Cyrus did just that. And to see these kinds of things, we, we understand that it means that, that what God has said is, is trustworthy, that what God has said is true, and it's valuable for us uh, to know about that. The scriptures say a couple of other things. God's word says some other things. This is what he says uh, when Paul is writing to Timothy about God's word. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it says this, All scripture, all of God's word, all of the Bible, is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Everything that's recorded, all of the Old Testament, all of the New Testament, all of it was written by God. God inspired all of it. That's what that means. And so as Paul is writing 2 Timothy, he's acknowledging these aren't just my words. These are God's words. All of Scripture, all of the Bible is God's word. And it doesn't have any mistakes in it. It doesn't have any errors in it. God did that perfectly and without error as it was originally written. And so we can trust that. It's something that we can uh, spend our lives thinking about, studying, learning about God from. In fact, it's, it's something that throughout all of history has been cherished and that people have been in love with. I love that it introduced me to Jesus when I first got to know him. I love it now. I study it regularly and teach from it consistently. And one of the things I want to talk about is about people who memorize it. That's something we do in Awana, but I want to talk to you about what another group of people, what their memorizing of the Bible looked like. And so for just a moment, we're going to talk about what it would have been like to go to school 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, the Hebrew people of God, when they wanted to study at school, they didn't go to school to learn science, and they didn't go to school to learn history, and most of them didn't even go to school to learn math. They went to school to learn the Bible. And so, if you were a, a little Hebrew boy or girl and you went to school, by the time you were about seven years old, your entire school job would have been for you to memorize the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You would have memorized all of it. I could have said to any of you, what's Leviticus chapter 14 said? And any one of you would be able to tell me because you're older than seven years old. And everybody seven and, uh, or older had memorized the first five books of the Bible. Then, as school would continue, and it wouldn't continue for everyone. Some girls only went to school till age seven. But anybody that went from school from seven until ten, by the time they were about ten years old, they would have memorized the whole Old Testament. All 39 books of the Old Testament they would have known by memory and could have just recited to anybody by about 10 years old. At that time, a lot of kids didn't get to go to school anymore. 10 years old, they were done going to school. But the number one job everybody wanted at that time was to be a rabbi, somebody who would teach about God's word. 
And because they had already memorized all 39 books of the Old Testament, if they wanted to continue to study, what they would then do is memorize what everybody had written about those books. All the commentaries, all the sermons, they would memorize those. So by about age 13 or 14, they would have memorized all of the Old Testament and all of the major teachings that had ever been written about it. And their hope was that they would then become a rabbi. People so much wanted to study God's word and learn how to teach God's word uh, that, that it was considered the most privileged job in the world. Here's what that would actually mean. People loved their rabbi, their teacher so much that if their rabbi and their dad both had to go to jail at the same time and you only had enough money to bail or get one of them out of jail, you were supposed to get your rabbi out before even your parents. If me and Mr. Ben somehow like robbed a bank together, we're not going to do that, but let's assume we did, or at least people thought we did. We clearly wouldn't have. But if we both got put in jail for that, we're getting ready to go to trial, it would mean you aren't supposed to get your dad out of jail. You're supposed to get me out of jail. You get to leave him there. You can decide if that's a good idea or a bad idea, uh, but it would say that you're supposed to get the teacher of God's word out of jail first because because at what we get from god's word is what's most important it's what's most valuable it's the things that we spend and uh, uh, value our life on and make life decisions based on and so it's supposed to be the most important thing and so there was something that they did for hebrew kids on the first day of school every year that i just want you to have a small option of doing today you don't end up you won't have to do this, um, but I think it's worthwhile, and so I'm going to allow anybody who wants to, uh, to do this, and it was based on something that's said in Scripture. I'm going to read a verse to you uh, from Psalm 19, and then I'll explain what would happen with kids on their first day of school uh, 2,000 years ago. This is from Psalm 19, talking again, uh, this is David writing, talking about God's Word. Verse 7 starts this way. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshes the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. They make wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right. They give joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant. They give light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure and endures forever. It's talking about the value God's word has. The decrees of the Lord are firm and all of them are righteous. And then it says this imagery language that it uses about how precious God's word is. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. And they are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. When it talks about God's word, as kids understood it 2,000 years ago, they understood everything God had said to be the most luxurious thing they could think of. More valuable to them than gold, that was the most precious commodity that the Bible talks about, and sweeter on their lips than honey. That was the best dessert the Bible talks about. And it was something that they didn't have a lot of access to in that time and culture. Uh, our culture is a little different. It's pretty easy for us to get honey the way we've commercialized things. I went to the store today and bought two things of honey. You can see them here. They're shaped like bears. That's what we've just decided to do in our society for some reason. Uh, but, but honey was uh, uh, considered a luxury, and, and for most kids, that kind of luxury meant it was the kind of thing you'd get once every couple of years, maybe on your birthday. Instead of a birthday cake, you'd get a little bit of honey, and it was about the only kind of sweet dessert you may get the whole year, except on the first day of school. And every year on the first day of school, when they would go to school and they would be given uh, what they would have called a slate to write on, they didn't use paper as much as we do, and so they would have more like a chalkboard, like a slate that they would write on. They would be given a new one at school every year, and when they would show up on the first day of school, their teacher wanted to remind them of how important it was to study God's Word, and that it was a luxury, that it was more precious than gold and sweeter than honey, and so they would take honey and they would cover the entire slate. Like picture your entire notebook covered in honey or your laptop, depending on what you do school on these days, just covered in honey. And before you do any work getting to learn about God's word, they wanted you to, to have the, the reminder of the luxury of it. And so you would then eat the honey. You would spend your first day of school just delighting in a party of sweets and celebration to remind yourself 
how good God's word is. Now again, you won't have to do this, but I'm going to ask Mr. Eric and Ms. Michelle to come join me. Um, and they're going to, if you want any, they're going to just put a dab of honey on your finger. And in a moment, I'll just read those verses again about how uh, sweet God's honey is for us. I'd encourage you not to put too much on because all of us are going to have trouble keeping it in place. But if you want to take that, anybody who wants one, you can take some napkins to give them as well. And then Eric, you can take this one. And as they come around, if you want just a little bit of honey, as we'll talk about the importance of God, oops, the importance of God's word and how precious it is to us, you, they'll just put a little dab on your finger. And then once we all have them, so once you get some, just try to make sure you're not dripping it too far uh, off things. And then we'll wait till everybody has them and we'll uh, take some time to read these verses and reflect on the value and the sweetness of God's word to us like those people would have 2,000 years ago. While they're doing that, some of the other things scripture says about God's word, God told Joshua that reading God's word is something we should do every day. He told Moses in Deuteronomy to tell everybody that we should talk about God's word everywhere we go. We should talk about it with our families. We should talk about it when we're inside, talk about it when we're outside. Uh, that it's supposed to be on our lips, something that's a present part of our lives uh, at every moment. So while we come to Awana and we think of and memorize and talk about God's word, that's wonderful. It's a great expression. But God would hope that we're doing that everywhere we go and with everyone we get to have conversation with. And so... Uh, it looks like I think we've gotten around to most of the tables. There's a last couple of people at the last table, but I'm going to just remind us of what God's word says. And when I get to the part of honey, we can all eat a little bit of honey together. God's word is perfect and refreshing for our souls. It's trustworthy. It's simple. It gives joy to our heart. It gives light to our eyes. It endures forever. It's pure it's firm and it's righteous and it's more precious than gold and it's sweeter than honey. And God, we're thankful for the gift of your word. We're thankful for the Bible and all that it teaches us about who you are, all that it teaches us about who we are. And we pray like those Hebrew boys and girls, that we would recognize your word is precious and valuable, that it's more uh, worthwhile to us than gold, that it's sweeter to our lips than honey, and that we would live our lives with your word as a delight and as a luxury. And help us to know how to do that. Help us to delight in it as we talk about it, as we memorize it, as we spend time reflecting around it together. Uh, we pray and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.